Welcome to Reason and Theology, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by my co-host, Roman Catholic, Eric Ibarra, and also guest, Dr. Michael. Uh, can you pronounce your last name? I don't want to uh, mispronounce well, there's, it. there's the proper Italian pronunciation, which is can, Licione, and then Licione. there's the, the American pronunciation that I use, because most Americans can't pronounce that. Yeah. It's yeah. called Licione. Licione. Okay. Well, I, I like Licione. We're going to go with that <laughs> the proper Italian way, uh, which, uh, of course, if anybody is not familiar uh, with the professor here, uh, he is a freelance writer. He's earned his PhD in philosophy from the University of Pennsylvania. He's taught philosophy at uh, over a dozen Catholic and secular institutions and has served on the editorial staff of First Things. Welcome to the show. How are you? Th thank you, Michael. Yeah, it, it's great to have you on. And we're talking about a topic that I'm really, really interested in. You, know, you asked me how yeah. I am, so I'll just give you the same answer that I always yeah. give. Not too shabby, just shabby. Not too enough. shabby. Right, right, right. <laughs> same, same here, same here. But, you know, I'm really looking forward to this because this is a topic that I find very interesting uh, because it involves Eastern Orthodoxy and it also involves the development of doctrine. So as y'all can see on the screen, uh, we're talking about Eastern Orthodox critiques um, of the development of doctrine, because we've we've actually had quite a few shows recently on this particular topic, but I think it is helpful for uh, ethics to respond to some of these critiques. Um, now, can I let, let me first um, back it up and ask you this? Maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself. How um, you know? I believe you're a revert to the Catholic Church. Maybe how that happened. Just tell us a little bit about your background. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, I grew up, or by some accounts failed to grow up, in the uh, New York area, mm. uh, uh, Staten Island to be specific. Oh, um, I lived there for three years, yeah. Oh, cool, right. Well, yeah. I, I went to a prominent, uh, you know, for high school, I attended a prominent Jesuit high school in the city, um, mm -hmm. where I did learn uh, quite a bit. And not everything uh, that I learned was what they intended to teach, but that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, uh, I, I would I was but I was uh, sexually molested by one of my teachers in my freshman and sophomore years there, so I became very depressed uh, and um, indifferent to the to the Catholic Church, and so my father pulled me out and put me in another. Catholic high school in another city the family had just moved to. And there I, I uh, spent my time getting the best grades I could so I could go to the college of my choice, which was Columbia University in, of course, New York. I loved Manhattan. So, and I lived there for my, almost my entire young adulthood. But anyway, um, when I started college, I, uh, I decided to ma double major in philosophy and religion. Uh, as a way of, of forming and settling on and inhabiting a worldview that, uh, you know, that would give meaning to my life. Uh, so uh, I, I took courses in all the major religions. I took philosophy of religion and, you know, many other philosophy courses. And uh, <clears throat> uh, you'll like this, Eric. I took New Testament with Elaine Pagels. <laughs> um, but uh, the the uh, eventually I worked my way from agnosticism back to philosophical theism and then finally to Christianity because I didn't find Islamic and and Oriental theologies all that persuasive. Um, and w once I got back to the Christianity stage, the question became, uh, well, am I going to be Protestant, Orthodox, or, or <laughs> heaven forfend Catholic? Right. And, and um, <clears throat> so I started out with the Protestants because, you know, they, they seem to be the most open and welcoming and flexible. And I figured, you know, if, if, if I can <clears throat> settle in with these evangelicals, uh, you know, I might be able to have a career uh, in the clergy, which would probably not have been the case in, in the Orthodox or Catholic Church. Uh, I like to joke I would, that I refuse to join any church that would that that would um well, nowadays I like to joke that I, I would never join any church that would ordain me, uh, just like Groucho Marx would never join any club that would have him as a member. But anyhow, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, I'm sorry, that's the motor jerk of, uh, across the street. If you heard that, but and anyhow, oh good, okay. 
Um, so I started out with Protestantism, but uh, and you know I liked it, and I especially liked the diversity of thought in the Protestant world that appealed to me as a philosophy guy. Uh, but then I read, then I made the mistake of reading Newman. Uh, reading John Henry Newman, you know, as much of it as I could get my hands on because I was so impressed with his prose as well as with his ideas. Reading Newman convinced me that I could not be Protestant, you know, and I began to read a lot more of the church fathers. Uh, now, of course, Newman had virtually nothing to say about orthodoxy, but I wasn't about to return to the Catholic Church at that point. <laughs> so, um, I, I started attending Orthodox liturgies and Orthodox retreats, and you know, I even got to speak with Alexander Schmemann for a lengthy session once uh, at St. Vladimir's Seminary, which is just north of New York City. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there, there was a lot about it that was very appealing to me, uh, both, uh, well, I mean, primarily on the spiritual and aesthetic level. Uh, but in the end, I, I couldn't. I couldn't take the plunge, right? It I mean, it seemed to me that no matter how, who I read, you know, uh, Callistos Ware, Alexander Schmemann, Florovsky, you know, any of the or Orthodox uh, writers in English that I could get my hands on, they didn't seem to me to have a consistent account of what uh, makes a council ecumenical, uh, and. To me, that was a very important issue because they were always talking about the ecumenical councils, you know, that that's our rule, uh, that those, those in scripture are our rules of faith. Well, I said to myself, well, of course, everybody says that scripture is, you know, among their rules of faith. But what's this ecumenical council stuff? I mean, if they're that important in your faith, then presumably you can tell me what makes a council ecumenical. Well, I couldn't find a unitary answer to that question in orthodoxy. It was basically a council is ecumenical if the right sort of people say it is, right? Uh, which, um, uh, well, it left me unimpressed, you know. I mean, there were various answers, and, and I don't have time to go through them all now, but perhaps that'll all come later. But, you know, one thing I noticed uh, that really hit me hard, and this is what tipped me over the edge back to the Catholic Church, um, the Council of Florence, the, the, the uh, Roman Catholic Council of, of Ferrara, Florence, uh, was one that ba had basically met all of the ancient, the, the first millennium criteria that I could find for ecumenical councils, uh, and yet the Orthodox rejected it on the grounds that the people would not receive it, right? Now, I said, hey, wait a minute. When, when does rece popular reception <laughs> suddenly become the unique and supreme criterion of ecumenical councils. This this seems no different from Protestantism, right? So um, I just so I reluctantly decided that the Catholic Church had to be the the Church Christ founded, and I was the most reluctant revert in the world because the last thing I wanted was for the Catholic Church to be the Church Christ founded, so that I was obliged to rejoin her. Right? Um, uh, you know, and and I've I've pretty much retained that attitude uh, to this day. I mean, to this day, what I like to say is that Catholicism is the worst worldview except for all the others. Right, and you know, uh, and that, you know, if you if you want vicious infighting, look no further than Catholics among themselves. Right, it's worse. It's worse than than interfaith in, uh, fighting, and you know it, it's worse than Protestant fighting. It's worth, e worse worse even than Orthodox fighting, right? So, um, uh, well, that's another thing. I have an Orthodox joke, but you, you, there might not be time for it. You want to hear it? Sure. This is a joke told among the Orthodox. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there's this parish where uh, people are fighting about. Uh, how, how to make the matanya, you know, the prostration, uh, which, uh, in front of icons, right? And, you know, they're, they're back and forth, back and forth, you know, people accusing each other of heresy and schism and so forth. And they go to the priest to try to resolve it. Uh, the priest takes one side, so that means the other side accuses him of heresy and schism and so forth. So uh, finally, you know, 
in, in despair, the priest says, well, why don't we go to uh, Elder Yohan, you know, up on the mountain, you know, and ask, ask him what's the true and ancient apostolic tradition, right? So they go to Father Yuan and they start arguing in front of him. They start arguing and fighting among themselves about, you know, what's the true and ancient apostolic tradition about uh, performing the Matanya. Uh, and, you know, after, so, you know, and they accuse each other of heresy and, and of being heretics and enemies of civilization and so forth. And finally, um, uh, Father, I mean, Elder Yuan, with tears streaming down his face, just looks at them, shakes his head and says, this is the true and ancient apostolic tradition, right? So, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a joke Orthodox tell among themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, so I returned to the Catholic Church and, you know, um, uh, it wasn't easy for me and it's still not easy to remain be because of all the crap that's been going on that everybody no knows about now. You know, the these sex abuse and cover up scandal about which I've published a se an article series. You know, and then there, there's uh, oh, there are just all kinds of problems in the Catholic Church. But, you know, just as the world is always going to hell in a handbasket, uh, the Catholic Church is, you know, is always mired in corruption and on the verge of, you know, of completely destroying herself. Right. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, and, and then I think that's uh, deliberate on God's part. I think uh, the Lord permits this in order to to remind us that salvation is his work primarily, not ours primarily. I don't want to say exclusively because that gets me into monergism, which I loathe. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, salvation is primarily God's work. The initiative comes from him. All we have to do is let ourselves be incorporated into it. And then we, you know, we can become either part of the solution or part of the problem. And, uh, and you know, so without that gratuitous grace, we're just part of the problem. <laughs> And nowhere is that better illustrated than in how Catholics carry on amongst themselves most of the time. Hmm. Well, let me um, let me maybe ask you this, just to kind of start, to, you know, bringing us into the direction of today's discussion. Let's talk about development of doctrine. Can you maybe explain to us what exactly does this mean? Because when we speak about development of doctrine, especially with Orthodox listeners, there's often a misconception of what they, the term actually means. So can you explain to us what is development in the Roman Catholic perspective? Well, I'm glad you uh, asked me what is it in the Roman Catholic perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, because... Uh, unlike with orthodoxy, you can point to one particular account and identify it as the Roman Catholic perspective, uh, uh, which is that given by the Second Vatican Council's, um, uh, it, within the Second Vatican Council's dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, Dei Verbum, right? Um, and, and I don't have the text of it in front of me, but, I mean, but anybody can look it up online. I, you know, I think this comes from uh, paragraph eight or seven or eight or something. But anyway, um, development of doctrine is the expression of an ever greater explicitness. Well, it, it's ever greater explicitness of expression of how we apprehend the the divine mysteries of revelation. So as the as the church goes on century after century and more and more people prayerful people meditate on these things and discuss these things we're able to formulate aspects of the deposit of faith more precisely in order to rule out uh, errors uh, and to uh, and to more precisely express what might have been uh, and in many cases was only implicit uh, in the in the deposit given to the apostles, uh, the, the faith once delivered to the saints, as I believe the KGV translation is. So that's that's the Roman Catholic understanding. But you know, of course, um, it would all fall apart if it weren't for Rome's authority structure, right? It would, I mean, it would all just be a matter of opinion of what counts as legitimate development of doctrine if it weren't for Rome's authority structure. You know, uh, I mean, according to the Catholic account, uh, we need some kind of living, infallible uh, agency to distinguish between what theological 
propositions are just matters of human opinion and which are actually authentic expressions of the deposit of faith, right? If you don't have that, well, then everything devolves into being a matter of human opinion, which is what you have in Protestantism. Uh, uh, in Protestantism, there is no way to draw a principal distinction between um, expressions, theological expressions that are human opinion from theological expressions that are divine revelation, right? I mean, why? Because if everybody's always fallible, every individual, every church body, Right then, even the question "What counts as scripture?" is a matter of opinion. So you know, so you can't appeal to the scriptural canon, you know, without some admitting some kind of infallible agency. Uh, now the question is, well, what is that agency? Uh, the orth the or the Eastern Orthodox I know. Well, anyway, I don't want to I don't want to get derailed right now into the question of authority. My point is that. As I understand uh, current uh, Eastern Orthodox theology, there is no consistent account of what development of, of, of what legitimate development of doctrine consists in, or even uh, whether such a thing is possible. Right? There, there are some Orthodox who hold that it isn't possible, like Father Andrew Louth mm -hmm. or, or Perry Robinson, for that matter. <laughs> Uh, yeah. who's, who's not a professional theologian, but but who's very influential in the online Orthodox world. Um, and, uh, you know, there are others, you know, such as the late Matthew Baker or or uh, uh, John Henry uh, uh, Reardon, Father Reardon. Patrick, jo yeah. John, Patrick uh, Reardon, I'm sorry, I was thinking yeah. of confusing you with Newman. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Patrick Reardon. Um, you know, there are others who do admit development of doctrine, but they don't agree on exactly how to formulate the concept. Uh, so, so there is no unitary account of, of, uh, of development of doctrine or even its possibility in the orthodoxy, whereas, you know, there is Catholicism. Now, can you maybe tell us what are some of the critiques that you, you've heard from, uh, for example, Dr. Louth and Father Louth also, um, that, that you've heard from people in the Eastern Orthodox camp who would say there is no such thing as uh, development of doctrine. What are well, some of the critiques? They, 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 uh, Orthodox thinkers, and not just Orthodox, right? Certain Protestants as well, will take the, uh, will construe the term development here in this context. Uh, to mean something different from what Catholics mean, right? Like, for example, some will take development to mean evolution of, mm -hmm. of dogma. You know, it's a survival of the fittest, <laughs> if you like. Um, uh, now, the Catholic Church herself condemns the concept of the evolution of dogma, right? It's essentially a modernist idea condemned by uh, Pius XII, but not just him. I mean. Uh, the substance of the condemnation occurred before him in the, you know, in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, right? Basically, the idea is that dogma is a human product that evolves in response to cultural and historical conditions, right? And, and the product of the evolution is just what um, best meets people's spiritual needs at any given uh, time and place, right? Now... If that's your concept of the development of doctrine, that, well, that's not, according to the Catholic Church, that is not legitimate. But many uh, Orthodox as well as Protestant thinkers will reject the development of doctrine as if it were just that concept of doctrinal development, <laughs> the, the evolution of dogma, which it really isn't, right? That's not what Vatican II meant by development of doctrine. Deve development of doctrine is an increase in understanding and explicitness of expression over time of a uh, unitary, unchanging deposit of faith. That's the Catholic understanding. Now, other there's another um, type of, of orthodox critique that I've encountered, and Daniel Latier taught me about this. Uh, where they will basically grant the correct concept of development of doctrine as the Catholic Church has officially expounded it, uh, but will deny 
that any distinctively uh, Catholic dogma uh, satisfies the criteria for legitimate doctrinal development. The classic case, of course, being uh, the filioque, right? Uh, but also papal infallibility and the Immaculate Conception. Now, you know, I'm going to rule out <clears throat> the Immaculate Conception as a counterexample right away, you know, because having read the history of that issue, uh, contributed to by a couple of scholars I respect, right, it seems that a lot of Orthodox did believe in the Immaculate Conception uh, as, as late as the mid-19th century and then recoiled from the doctrine as soon as the Pope defined it as dogma, right? So, uh that's all too predictable. So I don't take their critique on that point seriously. Uh, however, you know, the, the filioque and the papal claims, well, the filioque has been controversial for uh, over a thousand years, uh, at least among some Orthodox. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, uh, if, and if the Orthodox accepted the papal claims, then, you know, well, reunion with Rome would just be a formality, right? So, you know, most aren't about to do that. So they would deny that these two dogmas, and the filioque is a dogma in, in, uh, as far as Rome is concerned. They, they would deny that these two dogmas are legitimate doctrinal developments according to Rome's own criteria of legitimate doctrinal development. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, that's, I think, where the... Re it's on that point that the really interesting theological, the, the theological clashes can get really interesting. Um, you know, uh, now I, I do have my view, I, I do have a response to that, those arguments, but perhaps I should pause right now and, and make sure that we're still, that we're going in a fruitful direction. We, we're, we're going oh, no, no, this has been excellent. No, I, I, absolutely, we're, we're definitely okay, going well, to do that. Here's Can I just clarify one here. thing? Go ahead. Yeah, so your last point, I just wanted to clarify. You're, you're arguing that the Orthodox uh, argue against the Catholics and say that the filioque is a violation of Catholics' own criteria of doctrinal development, right. which, which illustrates their, their own implicit adoption of that criteria. In terms well, of yeah, there are some Orthodox who would agree, uh, those Orthodox who would accept the concept of development of doctrine uh, would accept the one that Vatican II expounded. Right. Uh, but they would, but some Orthodox would argue that the filioque and the papal claims do not, are not legitimate doctrinal developments according to that very concept of doctrinal right. development. Right. 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 Now, as I said, that's where the theological clashes get interesting. Yeah. Now, I, I do have a response to that, right? Which, uh, you know, but you know, they're not going to like it. <laughs> uh, well, let's hear it, though. Well, you know, I, I, one thing, you know, having spent as much time online as I have over the last 20 years, especially on Facebook for the last five or, you know, five years or so, uh, you know, ever since Amoris Letizia came out, um, uh, what, I, what I've noticed is that a lot of people, especially a lot of Catholics, want moral theology to, to uh, operate like software. You know, uh, you have the rule, you know, you have the rules that will crank out the right answer if you just input the data properly. <laughs> um, uh, so th there's, there's no, there's no, there's no um, fuzz factor for, um, Aristotle's man of prudence or, or, or practical judgment, right? Uh, every, you know, if you just understand the rules properly and are a person of goodwill and you've in, inputted the data properly, then, you know, out cranks the correct answer, right? A, a lot of Catholics want moral judgment to be like that, and it isn't. Uh, there are cases when the moral principles, even in uh, logical combination with the data cannot give you the uniquely uh, verifiable correct answer. Right now, in the case of um, uh, development of doctrine, right, there are people, you know, I, but I've, I've seen this among Catholics as well as Orthodox, and certainly among Protestants. Um, there are people who want 
the criteria for legit for legitimate development of doctrine to operate the way some people want more uh, moral theology to operate right they they want the criteria to be so clear and comprehensive and explicit that all you have to do is plug in the data and out will be cranked the correct the uniquely correct answer right it, do, it doesn't work that way right um usually like like for you know and the filioque is a perfect example of this you cannot um you, you cannot prove on the basis of premises that both sides affirm you cannot prove that the filioque is a legitimate development of doctrine because people don't even agree on how to define it much less where it came from right so you know it's just one of these things that ultimately can only be settled by authority i mean you can make a, a reasonable case either way as far as i can tell so it's one of the it's one of these these bitter theological disputes that can ultimately only be settled by authority. It's, you know, the the question is, what authority do you accept? And that's a whole nother argument. So would you say that um, uh, you know, so you in in the in the mechanics of argument, you have an appeal to authority or you have the appeal to reason, but on on the filioque way you got two sides that have a really good case when they appeal to reason. So it, it sort of reaches a stalemate, in which case an appeal to authority is the only thing that could crack the ice. Exactly. That's, that's why you have the Catholic Church's claim to infallibility under certain conditions, because ultimately there are certain disputes that only a, a charismatically uh, empowered and provided uh, teaching authority can settle. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, the, the apostles faced this in the New, you know, you can see this in the New Testament when they confronted heretics like Simon Magus or the Gnostics, right? Um, you know, ultimately they had to appeal to their apostolic authority directly bestowed by Jesus Christ himself, right? Um, uh, you know, and the rest of them were just, everybody else was an imposter, right? Well, this, this is... Uh, this is what the Catholic Church has consistently done throughout her history. Uh, and this is why we have so many schisms, because, you know, in every generation, there are people who simply cannot accept this, right? They're, they're more, they're more, they're, they're, uh, they cling more closely to their own theological ideas than to uh, the apostolic authority that the bishops inherit from the apostles and Jesus Christ, and ultimately from Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying that that the theological, uh, the strictly theological <coughs> arguments on both sides are irrelevant. You know, just a matter of authority. You know, forget about the theology. Rome says, you know, Roma locuta es causa finita. Right? No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I think that if you know, if you read the history of the uh, theological arguments. Uh, there are some very interesting and fruitful points being made by both sides, right? Uh, right? Now, but ultimately what I would say about the filioque is this, right? That um, even the Orthodox I've, I've disputed this question with admit that the Son has something to do with the Holy Spirit's eternal procession from the Father something to do with it, right? Well, you know, what's anathema to them, and rightly so, uh, is the idea that the son, uh, uh, the, the, the son's contribution is of the same sort uh, as the father's. And, you know, if that were the case, then there would be no way to distinguish between the, you know, I mean, there would be no principled way to distinguish between the son and the father. Right? So, um, the Son has something to do with the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father. Uh, but any more specific account of how is just theological speculation. You know, I mean, the, the idea that we can give a more specific account of that, uh, uh, of that, you know, of, of God's inner life than, than what I've just stated, I think, you know, it, it, uh, is comical hubris, right? 
I mean, if, if the original data of Revelation were sufficient to settle this question clearly, uh, then it would have been settled by now. Like, for instance, both sides agree that the Holy the Father sends the whole in the economy of salvation, the Holy Spirit is sent to us by the Father through the Son, by virtue of what the Son does. Uh, that's not in dispute. The question is about the eternal procession of the Spirit from the Father. Now, the data of Revelation are clear on the first point. Yes, the Holy in the economy of salvation, the Holy Spirit is sent to us by the Father through the Son. The data are clear. If the data were equally clear about the, the Spirit's eternal procession, then there would be equal agreement. <laughs> but there, is, but it isn't, so there isn't. Right. So, you know, and if you try to get clearer about God's inner life than that, it's just, I think, as I said, it's comical hubris. So as I see it, the question, uh, the, the question should be left vague. Yes, the Holy Spirit has something to do with the Son's eternal procession of the Father, because the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son. Right. But beyond that, it's all just speculation. And, and we should stop calling each other her <laughs> heretics and enemies of civilization about uh, different speculations. You know, could, could I maybe um, divert just slightly from our, our topic to kind of put the ball in the Eastern Orthodox court and ask, do you think that there are um, actual developments in, in Eastern Orthodoxy? If so, what are they? You mean uh, we're off the filioque now, not to more general, right. more general. Yeah, topic. more general. Yeah, just more generally. Any anything that you think that Eastern Orthodoxy maintains that is an well, a, that is, there are some Orthodox theologians have, have produced some very interesting theological uh, work uh, in this during the second millennium, including in the twentieth century. But as far as I know, there is no. Uh, bit of theology uh, in the last 700 years in, within orthodoxy that commands enough assent to be considered doctrinally binding within orthodoxy. I know there's been no theological, there's been no second millennium theological development within orthodoxy that has attained sufficient uh, consensus, that, that has, enjoys con sufficient consensus uh, for them to count it as doctrinally binding. I think the, the last the last de development of doctrine that is generally considered binding within orthodoxy would be um, uh, uh, hesychasm, right? But that's more about spirituality uh, than about um, systematic theology, strictly speaking. Uh, well, anyway, that's my answer. That I'm aware of. Now, I'd be happy if I if I'm in, in error. I'd be happy to be enlightened, but I don't. I just don't see it. Do you think iconography and the, of course, uh, dulia given to icons is perhaps a development? Well, yes, it was, but that took place. Uh, that took place in the uh, eighth and ninth centuries, in the for, during the sure. first millennium. Um, yeah. The, uh, the hesychasm thing developed in the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries, in the second millennium. Uh, and so there has been, I mean, look, there has been do doctrinal development within orthodoxy. Uh, every dogmatic definition uh, generated by the first seven, uh, by the, the ec quote unquote ecumenical councils, the councils both sides agree are ecumenical, right? Every doctrinal definition uh, generated by those councils is a development. Uh, the very the very concept of a trinity is a development. I mean, it's not a radical development. Jesus talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> uh, but you don't see the word trinity in Scripture. It's a later development, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so you, you have a lot of doctrinal development in the first millennium. But as far as I can tell, uh, since... Uh, 13, 1400 or so, there hasn't been any dogmatic development within orthodoxy. There have been interesting theological uh, work. There's been interesting theological work, and I think some of it does merit um, uh, further consideration for doctrinal purposes 
once the two uh, once the, the Roman and Eastern Orthodox communions can reunite, but that might not come till the Parousia. Excellent. And I, I want to pass it over to you, Eric, because I know you have some uh, questions that you yeah. um, that, that you have prepared. And then I'm going to come back on the tail end and ask some further uh, follow up questions. OK. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I you may have read this uh, essay in this book that uh, was uh, compiled in honor of Jaroslav Pelikan. Uh, it's called Orthodoxy in Western Culture. And uh, this wasn't, is the, it, wasn't it a fest shrift for Pelican? Yes. Yes, yep, I, I have heard of it, but I, I can't recall whether I've, I've read anything that's in it or not. Yeah, so it's, um, you know, it's published by St. Vladimir Seminary Press. Um, and um, it's got essays in here mm. um, by, by, you know, Father John McGuckin, uh, Father Andrew Louth. So all um, the heavyweights, right, right, who write in English. Yeah, yeah. in the English-speaking, yeah, I guess in the English-speaking world, I guess you could say these guys are, um, you know, heavy hitters. But Father Andrew Louth says something in here. I'm, I'm pulling up the page here. Because he, he basically contributes an essay on is doctrinal development a valid category in the Orthodox Church? Um, and by category, it, meaning it, is it something that even has a, a place in mm. in Orthodox thinking? And yeah, I, um, I did read that essay years ago. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think its inclusion in this anthology um, is later, right? It had already been out there in some journal, and it, right. and it later got included in this anthology. Yes, I read it years ago, and I actually wrote a rebuttal of it on my old blog. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. Um, it, it gets passed around still to this day. Wow, um, I didn't know that. <clears throat> yeah, um, but he he makes a distinction in here uh, between doctrinal development, which goes according to logical necessity. So uh -huh. if you have, if you have a premise, uh, premise one, um, all human beings are sinners. Uh, premise two, Eric Ibarra is a sinner. Um, or, I mean, I'm Eric, sorry, Eric is a human Eric, being. Yeah. Eric Ibarra is a human being. And then inference um, being, okay, Eric Ibarra is a sinner. Um, so that's uh, all the material that would dictate the inference is inside the premises, right? Yes, yes, that's deductive um, necessity. Deductive necessity. But he says he he describes uh, Newman's account of doctrinal development as spontaneous, unpredictable, and random developments. That, that, and as I argued in my old blog, that, that's a straw man. Right. Uh, New, Newman provided criteria for identifying legitimate doctrinal developments, and while they they do not establish deductive necessity. Right, nor could they, in my view. Uh, they are by no means arbitrary or random in their application. Uh, they are what I would call inductive rules of thumb. You know, uh, so like uh, if a given if a given theological proposition satisfies these criteria according to some reasonable interpretation of these criteria, uh, then it is a fit candidate for graduation to doctrine. Right. Uh, however, they, you can't show by using these criteria that it must be doctrine. Right? You can't, because it doesn't follow deductively from, from the data it draws on. Right? Um, I mean, if all development of doctrine were simply a matter of deductive necessity, then there would be no dispute about what doctrines count as legitimate developments, all you would do, uh, you know, is program a computer in the right way and have it, you know, crank crank out the answer. Right. That's that's not that's not how these things work any more than moral theology can always work that way. Yeah, I um, I'm, I'm working my way through some uh, ancient texts on uh, on monothelitism, and uh, that was the Christological controversy over the 
the acts and operations and energies and wills in Christ. Mm. And um, it's just amazing to see how some of the figures that, especially the Orthodox, um, take for complete grant to have been solidly consistent uh, actually went through developments themselves. Like Sophronius of yes. Jerusalem, uh, Sophronius of Jerusalem is famous for, um, you know, his his uh, famous treatise on the uh, the the operate two operations in Christ and uh, the two wills. Um, well, two wills comes a little later, but he he went through a little bit of development in his own thought, and so did Maximus. And Maximus kind of changes. Yes. Maximus kind of changes his tune um, when he's uh, being interrogated, and uh, but virtually, I mean, I, I, I've I've read some uh, scholarship on this, and it it seems as though there was just as much patristic support for a singular will um, as there was for the duality, the the two wills, and it it wasn't easy to decipher uh, this issue. And so I, I'm just thinking same, of this deductive this right, this is, idea. Exactly. This is the same kind of problem we face with the history of the filioque. Right? right. If you just look at the early right. data that supposedly establishes the, what the deposit of faith has to, is, right. I mean, you could it could go either way. There seems to be... Uh, you know, a rough equality uh, between the two. Right, right, yeah. right. And that, that's that's one of the reasons why, even to this day, um, the the ancient method of uh, florilegia, which is basically just giving a bunch of patristic quotes, um, everybody gets annoyed by that today. Um, whether whether it's the Catholic who's just throwing out uh, quote you know quote after quote on the papacy or or something else, um, or if it's the Orthodox who's, you know, putting out quotes on the the singularity of the Father uh, as cause of the Son of the Spirit, mm. and yeah, uh, they're using the word "cause" there in a particular, very particular, almost technical sense. Yeah, right. Anyway, so, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So you know, in other words, <clears throat> so uh, the point I guess I'm asking here is that Father Andrew Louth seems to be only envisioning a, 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 a theological development according to deductive necessity. Yes. Um, but that doesn't seem to be, uh, that doesn't seem to be the only uh, mode of, of legitimate development. There, right. No I mean, if, if it were the only legitimate mode of doctrinal development, then there would be, there would be basically a mechanical process for settling all these issues. Right. Right. Uh, because deductive necessity is just that. Once you've understood the logical form of the right. propositions in the argument, then it's simply a, a matter of, of, you know, mechanics to decide whether the argument is valid or not. Right. Right. Uh, now, so that would be a way to render all of these issues uncontroversial. But you know, history shows that that a lot of these uh, doctrinal issues are not like that at all. Right. The other thing he brings up here is um, that doctrinal development can give off the idea that the apostles were infantile in knowledge. Mm. And, you know, it required, you know, they, they did their very well best that they could, you know, uh, as four bo you know, poor boobies. <laughs> <laughs> as, you know, first century fishermen, they did the best right. they could. Um, Paul gave a little bit of an advancement. But, of course, it's nothing compared to the great thinking of the uh, medievals and, and you know, post-enlightenment uh, philosophical thought. And um, so, you know, development of doctrine, I guess there's two issues here. So, so the first thing is, does it really say, does it insinuate that we're saying that we know more than the apostles and that if they were to transmit themselves here somehow in some sort of lapse in, in, in history, they'd have to take a seat and uh, be taught all of our doctrines because they just didn't know enough. 
And uh, so let's start there. Does, does, are, is what we're saying by doctrinal development that the apostles, uh, that we know better than them, we know more than them, and they we needed to um, basically add to what they're saying? Well, I don't think anything in particular follows about the state of the, I mean, if, if you admit that doctrinal development is legitimate and ongoing, Nothing in particular about the apostles' state of mind or dispositions follows. Um, we can't stip we cannot stipulate that the apostles knew all this stuff all along, just never got down to writing it down, never got around to writing it down. We can't say that. Uh, nor can we say, well, the apostles were just ignorant fishermen um, uh, who would never have understood these matters like we do. I, I don't think we can conclude that either. Um, we just don't know, uh, you know, and, and I think that that's really part of the point of God setting things up this way, right? That, um, we're in no position to say what the apostles would have said about our later formulations. And we're not supposed to, that's not how things are set up, right? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, the, the church's teaching authority is ongoing and living, Right. So, you know, I mean, you know, it's, look, in, in philosophy of religion, uh, there, there's an ongoing, well, not just philosophy of religion, but straight theology, there's an ongoing dispute about something called middle knowledge, you know, knowledge of what, of what would have happened or, or knowledge of what people would have done uh, had, you know, had circumstances been a bit different, right? Now, I think when... Uh, uh, this led to a particularly bitter dispute in the Middle Ages, uh, that in the later Middle Ages that Popes eventually just had to call a halt to. But um, uh, my own position is that middle, when you're dealing with uh, with human agency, uh, middle knowledge is generally impossible. You can't say what you know somebody would have done had circumstances been different because you're dealing with a human free agent, right? Right. Uh, so even if there is a fact of the matter about what somebody would have done, if, you know, certain circumstances had been different, we can't know it <laughs> because we're not in a position to take into account all the relevant factors. Now, I, I think the same applies in the case of the, of what the apostles would have said uh, about our vaunted uh, doctrinal developments, right? We're not in a position to say what they would have said uh, about some of these things or about most of these things uh, because that's not how God has set things up. You know, we have a living authority. We can't, you know, we, we can't settle doctrinal disputes by simply assembling the best scholars who have the best interpreta interpretations of the ancient data. Uh, I mean, that can settle certain matters of fact, all right, certain empirical matters, historical matters, but not doctrinal matters. Uh, you cannot come, you cannot, it, it just, in the very nature of the case, it is not possible to determine what is and is not a legitimate doctrinal development simply by quality scholarship and into the ancient sources. If, if, it, if that were possible, then we'd be back with the computer I've been talking about. Uh, yeah, it would be kind of like uh, if Christ gave the apostles uh, all of the scripts for the ecumenical councils, and he gave them, you know, he said, in, you're going to run into this problem in the 4th century, you're going to run into this problem mm -hmm. in the ninth century, and here's here's Photius's mystagogy, make sure you put that in there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't seem as though time permitted the apostles to address, you know, everything because that just wasn't in the field of vision. Exactly. I mean, look, the New Testament, the Gospels do not tell us everything Jesus said and did, right? So we we can't, uh, uh, in those cases, say what Jesus said or did. We can only speculate. Uh, similarly, uh, the apostles were men who lived ordinary lifespans. Uh, so we don't have a record of everything they said and did during those lifespans. I mean, we, we have some information here and there. Some of it, some of it, 
is indistinguishable from legend, even if it's perfectly factual. We don't we don't have independent corroboration. So, um, uh, it, you know, in most cases, it simply is not possible to say what the apostles would have said about the theological controversies that exercise us. I mean, when the issue is which doctrine is uh, a legitimate development and which is just yeah, a theological opinion and which is actually a corruption, right? That's up. That's up to the magisterium to decide over time because they have the same authority as the apostles. See, this, this is something that people, a lot of people, including I'm afraid a lot of Catholics, cannot wrap their minds around. Right? The idea that the bishops, you know, that the sor sorry lot that they are, actually have the authority of the apostles. Well, if that's the case, then it makes no sense to appeal to the apostles against what they collectively decide, right? Uh, I mean, if, if it's true, right? Uh, now, it's rejection of, of the idea that the Bishop, the the College of Bishops, the collect, you know, the 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 collection of bishops in, in consultation with each other. The idea that the College of Bishops has the authority of the twelve, has inherited the authority of the twelve apostles. Well, that's what that's exactly the premise that Protestants reject, right? But if you accept that, then you rule out being able to set up a scholarly machine for assessing doctrinal developments in, in a lot of cases, or in fact, in most cases, I would argue. You simply have to, you simply have to I mean, the, infor the information provided in the course of these controversies is important and interesting, but ultimately the decision is in the hands of the people who have inherited the authority of the 12. And, uh, you know, they, they, they would use certain criteria, but not, these criteria, not I mean, these criteria that they would use, are not themselves all fully statable and explicit. Uh, yeah, eventually, you just get down to the point of appealing to the charism. Uh, in this case, the charism of, of uh, episcopal infallibility, which none of the bishops enjoy individually, but they do collectively under certain conditions. Now, what happens if you have a a, a war? of episcopates you know so if you have the you know for example uh, any given century the fifth century the, the 11th century and today you have episcopate option one uh the catholic episcopate then you've got the chalcedonian orthodox episcopate option two and then you've got the oriental uh the orthodox, non chalcedonian or orthodox non right Chalcedonians, right um, think about it. In the fifth century, Alexandria excommunicated the Pope, excommunicated Constantinople, Constantinople excommunicated right. Rome. The fight, the fight had, rarely stopped. Right. Right. You you had a, a war of episcopates, and then they all say. Uh, so, in, in, in other words, in in it almost would seem because in, in in my study of church history. You've got all kinds of paradigms available. You've got the Tertullian paradigm, which says, you know what? Forget the institution. It's so sinful. I'm just going to go with the charism. I don't care about office anymore. That, and that's a very understandable attitude. A lot of people today take it. Yeah. Right. But then you've got, uh, then you've got um, perhaps the, uh, the small clique that uh, followed Novation. You know, and and they they drew a circle around their bishops, and then you've got the Donatists, and they drew a circle around their bishops. Right. Then you've got the Nestorian. Um. Uh. You've got the Nestorian, uh, which came to the, the you know the far eastern uh, uh, church of Persia. They drew right. a circle around their episcopate, and then the 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 the, the mono the 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 Miaphysites drew a circle around their episcopate, and then and then finally the Greeks. Uh, and the uh, uh, you know whatever whichever century you know 13 14 15 you know the the eastern canon lawyers were already saying that the latins were schismatics way back in the ninth century but right. they they drew a circle around their episcopate so you've got a war of episcopates and in that case an appeal to charism or an appeal to well our our episcopate is the one that has the holy spirit 
<laughs> well, the only way out of that box is the Pope, right? So, you know, the, uh, the only person who embodies the unity of the church when the bishops are fighting with each other, which is most of the time, uh, is the Pope, right? Now, this doesn't mean the Pope, you know, and, and, when, I, and when I talk about charism, I'm not, I don't, I'm not saying that the Pope is a more spirit-filled person than other uh, Christians. Uh, he may be a real son of a bitch, right? The, the, uh, what I'm saying is that, the, the, you know, the charism of the papacy is to hold the church together, uh, and that manifests itself nowhere more clearly than in papal infallibility. Uh, but also papal universal jurisdiction is necessary because if, if the Pope only has jurisdiction over Rome or Italy, then he can't hold the church together. <laughs> right. um, now, so it basically it goes like this. You know, we want to be able to say that the church as a whole believes such and such, right? Uh, an example of that would be the, the, the uh, Nicene Creed, the, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed to be precise. Creed of 381. The church as a whole believes this. Uh, well, but who's the church? <laughs> you know, is, is it is it the 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 Romans, the Eastern Orthodox, the Oriental Orthodox, uh, the Nestorians, the you know, you, the Miaphysites, you can go on and on, right? Who is the church? Those in communion with the Bishop of Rome, whose charism is to hold the church together, right? And then the question is, well, but how are these judgments made about what doctrines and practices are legitimate and which are not? Well, ideally, this should be set, uh, settled on the ground, right? You, you know, just people having the sense of what is and is not appropriate. And there are cases like that. But there are other cases where that's not sufficient. So then you refer to the bishop. Well, but then sometimes often bishops disagree with each other. So then you refer to a council. Well, then sometimes council, one council is, you know, rejects or is, uh, rege or is rejected by other people. Then what? Well, that's where the Pope comes in. You have to have the Pope at the apex in order to hold the whole thing together, or else it just becomes a bunch of people uh, squabbling with each other without any principled way of settling their differences. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, you know, in my own studies and uh, in your own studies and um there's definitely ancient roots for that Petrine protocol, you yes. know. But but what would you say to the Orthodox who who turns the tables here and says, "Okay, fine, you have this unitary, singular, um, you know, indivisible subject that you know that that his will is the will that everyone has to kind of centrifugally." Um, surround and submit to. I think you but, mean centripetally. Centripetally, right. yeah. So, but so what happens if that unitary singular subject who supposedly, you know, makes the orbit one, what, what happens if it implodes? So it, where he himself becomes an enemy of, uh, you know, Christ well, and, and that depends on circumstance. Like, for instance, uh, you know, the the Rome has had some really, really, really bad popes. Right. In that case, you know, in cases like that, the church is crippled at the top for a while. Um, there are other cases where, you know, there are a couple of other cases where the pope is personally a heretic. I think John the twenty second was one good example. Uh, the Honorius case is, you know, one that, uh, you know, to me, it can't be settled by his, you know, we don't know whether Honorius was personally a heretic or whether uh, he simply misunderstood the issue, you know, when he wrote his letter to Sergius. Uh, so, you know, but I mean, you know, it's certainly possible for a pope to be a heretic, right? And when he is, right, the only thing we can say is, well, that's really unfortunate, you know, that, that, sort of kicks the church into a ditch for a bit. Uh, but, you know, the Holy Spirit will never let the Pope bind the church as a whole to his heresy. You know, because that, that's what we believe as, as Catholics. So there are definitely, and, you know, and then there was the case of, well, what was the case of Pope Vigilius in, in the, was it the sixth century? 
Yes, uh, yes. You know, he, he was, uh, you know, the three chapters controversy was a disgrace. He was kept, he was captured, beaten and tort, you know, he was beaten, captured, beaten, tortured and imprisoned by the Byzantine emperor. I think it was Justinian, but uh, anyway, yeah, sure. uh, you know, so he ended up signing off on something which is objectively heretical. Right. Uh, but it can't really be said that he, it, you know, he did so under duress. So it can't really be said that the, the, the church is bound by this. Uh, you know, so there are always going to be cases where popes fail in a human way. Uh, right. right. Um, that's not a regular occurrence. They're, they're, you know, but I mean, popes do make mistakes. The only time when... <laughs> The only time they're preserved from error is when they're teaching, freely teaching a doctrine to be believed uh, as de fide by the whole church. Uh, so when popes are bad or, you know, whether they're, when they're heretics or weak need or, you know, personally evil, uh, well, well, that means the church is in a bad way. But as I, you know, as I said toward the beginning of this broadcast, the church is, is almost always in a bad way. Just as the world is always going to hell in a handbasket, the, the church is always uh, uh, mired in corruption and controversy, right? I think this is just uh, the nature of the beast. And I, and I think, you know, God knows this and allows this for very good reason. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm. Uh, Michael can take the mic here for a second. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't want to really you know derail things here but it, it is related to some of the things that you said uh here recently and also earlier in the program you were talking about how in relation to protestantism but by extinction uh extension orthodoxy um you you really can't discern between what is a actual legitimate development and what is just a human tradition apart from the magisterium apart from an infallible um author teaching authority well, on um, occasion, you, you, can. you, you know, on they, occasion they, in the Catholic can. Church, there is. A, mm -hmm. But in some cases, you, you might need that infallible teaching authority, yes, is, is yes. what it sounded like you were saying. Yes. Um, in, those, in, in those instances, um, in order for me to say that, okay, this is an infallible authority, I have to go ahead and make a fallible decision and say, I, I believe that this is a legitimate um, authority established by Christ. I have to go ahead and make a fallible judgment. Mm -hmm. So, wouldn't you say that your 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 standard there, your authority, is still sitting on a fallible uh, sand, if you will? Because ultimately, I'm having to make a fallible decision to determine right. that this isn't a fallible right. authority. That yeah, I'm well, this to. is the argument I usually faced when I you maybe when I was involved that. with called the communion. Sorry, Eric, what did you say? No, I, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm called the communion. This is called the two cloque argument, right? Or used to be. I, I haven't followed the site for a while, right? I mean, we like to, yeah, yeah. Catholics like to criticize Protestants yeah. for saying, oh, you know, you don't have anybody who's infallible. You know, it's all just a matter of opinion, which is why you have, you know, X thousand numbers of, of quarreling denominations. Uh, well, the Protestants will come right back with the two quoque and say, hey, wait a minute. You Catholics have the same problem, right? You have to fallibly decide whether whether the Pope and the bishops are, in, you know, are infallible or not, right? Now, uh, the two quoque objection uh, runs together two, issue, two points that need to be kept separate, right? One question, uh, one issue is how you decide um which church's claims for itself are valid now that's a matter of human reason which on its own is fallible right uh you can only you know when when you're when you're talking on that level you can only talk about which positions are more reasonable than others and what i used to argue on called the communion uh, is that the Catholic position is more reasonable than its denial because without the, the bit about infallibility, you have no principled way of distinguishing between um, authentic expressions of divine revelation and mere human theological opinions. So if you want to be able to make the ascent of faith uh, to uh, 
uh, a set of propositions uh, formulated and mediated by some church body, uh, the more the most reasonable thing to do is look for a church body uh, that uh, claims infallibility under certain conditions. Right now, the Mormon uh, church claims that under certain conditions. So then you have to say, well, whose claim is more reasonable? You know, when you look at history. So, sure. you know, and I, and, 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 but my point is that, that's a matter of opinion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now, I don't, personally, I don't see how you can rebut uh, the argument I just made, that it's more reasonable to accept a church that claims infallibility under certain conditions than to leave it all to opinion. Because if you leave it all to opinion, then there is no, then the ascent of faith is really impossible. We can make the, the ascent of divine faith only to what we can be certain uh, is divine authority. <laughs> and, you know, if, if, all the, if all theological propositions are matters of human opinion, then we're not able, then we can't do that. We can't make that kind of ascent. So there has to be some infallible body. And then the question is, well, wh which is it? Uh, now, now here, here's my point. If one of them really is what it claims to be, and you make and you accept it as such, well, then, um, if then if you're wrong, you're disastrously wrong. But if you're right, uh, then uh, what you've got here is something that goes. Uh, your ascent is no longer the ascent of opinion, but the ascent of faith. You have stepped beyond the process by which you decided whom to put your faith in. You've now put your faith in them, so you're no longer you're no longer willing and able to entertain the possibility that you might be wrong, because because what has been infallibly taught is now being infallibly accepted by you as a member of that subject, namely the church, whose infallibility the pope and the bishops um, express. That was, that's a really good answer. That that's pretty much what what I've been able to conclude again. Um, well, for for myself, so I really do appreciate that. Um, could you maybe tell us a, a a little bit more? Are there any other uh, Eastern Orthodox critiques that you've heard of the Catholic understanding of the development of doctrine that you have found actually pretty impressive, though you may not agree with them? Ultimately, you you do th think that there is some merit to them. And what are your responses to them? Well, the most powerful one that I've encountered uh, is, is to the idea um, that the papal claims uh, are themselves a development through which it's dishonest to read history retroactively. Um, uh, you know, for instance, if you look at... Uh, I mean, there, there, were, there were people, in the, there were Catholic thinkers in the 11th century who were carrying on as if the Pope were infallible under certain circumstances. Um, in fact, I believe Pope Agatho, when he, uh, back in the, what, what was it, the, the, uh, the 6th century, Eric? I forget. Yeah, 7th uh, century. After, after 7th century, after the uh, Monothelite, he accepted the condemnation of Honorius. But he did so in language which suggested that under certain conditions, the popes are infallible, right? Um, uh, so he must have thought that Honorius really didn't mean to teach heresy to the whole church. He was, he was just sloppy and you know, woolly-headed and got it wrong, right? Something like that. But anyhow, uh, uh, so, you know, there are glimmerings of, of papal infallibility. Uh, uh, but... Uh, you don't really get anything explicit on the topic until well into the Middle Ages and the count and into the Counter Reformation. Uh, so, you know, I've heard Orthodox argue that um, there's a very good reason for this, right? Namely, that back in the first millennium, people really didn't. Uh, you know, people were just uh, uh, people in, in in neither Rome nor Constantinople nor any of the ancient patriarchs. People weren't really prepared to say that Rome was infallible. <laughs> you know, they, they they were willing to honor Rome as as you know the Sea of Peter and and where the bones of Peter and Paul were buried, and you know, <laughs> and they were willing to acknowledge that Rome had a, a very impressive record of orthodoxy. So it was a good rule of thumb to refer things to Rome. But nobody was really prepared to say that Rome is ever infallible, <laughs> right? Um, 
And I mean, you know, that's a pretty good argument because, you know, if you go back to the first millennium, there is no evidence that anybody is really willing. There's no explicit evidence that anybody ever said that Rome is ever infallible. Right. So or how, do these, thing, how do these things know. get settled? How, you know, how do all these disputes mm -hmm. get settled? You know, if, if the cap, if, if the Catholic Church's uh, official account today of how a teaching authority works in the church, if, if that were a legitimate development from the common faith of the church in the first millennium, you would expect there to have been more evidence of it in the first millennium, but there isn't, right? So that's the most impressive orthodox argument I've seen. Yeah, and um, y'all go ahead and start sending your chat questions. I don't see any coming up yet. So anything that you have for uh, Dr. Uh, Lichione, go ahead. People are just uh, dazzled by the brilliance of our, our conversation. <laughs> you know, what I find yeah, interesting, I, it, it, I'm sorry. Ahead, no, I was going to say, well, you know, when I was an Anglican uh, looking into Catholicism and Orthodoxy, um, I was initially more drawn to Orthodoxy. And uh, the reason why was because when I was studying uh, the first millennium history, um, I would see things that really collided with the papal claims. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, but I, but what I realized was I was committing some sort of intellectual fraud because anytime I could find a, a good argument against Catholicism, um, it was, a, it, it amounted to an immediate point for orthodoxy. Um, so when I was studying Rome and I was seeing all these holes I was looking to the other side and orthodoxy had like a stack of coins. So I was like, wow, I, you know, I'm drawn to orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. But then I said, well, wait a minute, let me apply this same historical fire to orthodoxy that I have been doing to, to Catholicism. Yes. And, and what you find is that there may not be as much evidence for papal infallibility uh, as we would like in the first millennium, but is there evidence for conciliar infallibility? Um, no, none. Is there, you know, you see what I'm saying? So in other words, uh, what some people do is they'll say, well, if there, if, if Rome has a weak argument historically, that must gratuitous, gratuitous, uh, I'm sorry, my, I'm, I'm running into a tongue tie. That must mean that orthodoxy automatically uh, gets a point. But that's not always true, and that's that. By applying the same equal weights is really what um, actually stopped me from just jumping into the Orthodox Church. I think well, we might have some questions. Well, you you've you've uh, segued into the point I wanted to make uh, to the kind of response I wanted to make to the Orthodox argument. Uh, for me, right uh, in my own journey, and I, and I think that this is you know ultimately the only uh, direction that makes sense. Uh, the reason to accept the idea of ecclesial infallibility, you know, just put papal infallibility aside for a moment. The only reason to accept the idea of ecclesial infallibility in light of, uh, the, you know, the often sordid history of the church uh, is the philosophical one that I described earlier in response to the two quoque arguments. Without such an without such a teaching agency, it's all a matter of opinion, and the ascent of faith of, of divine faith is therefore impossible. All right, so if God meant to reveal something once for all to the holy ones, uh, and enables us to ascend to it over the centuries, then there has to be such a living, infallible agency. It looks like Eric has disappeared. Does it look like that way to you? Yeah, uh, Michael. I think, uh, I may have lost connection there. Are you able to hear us, Eric, by any chance? I don't see video feed. Yeah, I think something cut him off. He'll, uh, I'm sure he'll be able to just um, exit the stream and come right back. Uh, so he right. So basically, my point was that you know the main reason for accepting, I mean, you can't accept ecclesial infallibility because the church says so. That's that's just circular. The main reason for accepting it is philosophical. Without it, the ascent of divine faith is impossible. And presumably God wants us to make an ascent of faith in his authority. So uh, then the question becomes, uh, great, now which church, small c, 
uh, enjoys this status. Uh, and, and, you know, then we get into a whole nother historical argument. But, you know, Michael, perhaps this is a good stopping point. We seem to have lost Eric and we don't have any other questions. Yeah. I do see um, just a couple chat questions, if that's OK, uh, if you have a few moments. Uh, if I see I see one from Eric's website that says, oh, I see. Well, there's, uh, here's there's one that just right popped here. up. Patrick. Yeah. What constitutes improper development of doctrine for the Eastern Orthodox? Couldn't one say that the priestly vestments, liturgical format, chants are themselves development of doctrine? What do you think about that? Well, that's a matter of definition. I mean, the, the examples, I'm sorry, what was the name of the person answering that, asking that question? That one was Patrick. All right, Patrick. I think that's largely a matter of definitions. Um, liturgical accoutrements, I think, uh, can vary legitimately from one time to another or one place to another. Uh, so, no, I, I uh, liturgical praxis, at that level, it, it is to me not a doctrinal matter really at all. You know, where it becomes a doctrinal matter is in what you understand the liturgy to be doing, right? Um, uh, Catholics and Orthodox believe that what's going on in the liturgy is a, you know, is a participation uh, in the, the Pasch of Christ. Uh, and what we consume is Jesus Christ in the fullness of his being. I know those are certainly doctrinal issues, but if you're just talking about, you know, vestments and, and uh, you know, other things that can legitimately vary. No, I don't think that those are doctrinal matters of development of doctrine at all. I, uh, I'm looking for some more chat questions. I don't see any. If y'all have any more, go ahead and put them in now. Otherwise, we'll go ahead. Well, and, uh, I see one up. from Eric's website that says, if you get a chance, ask about warring episcopates during the Great Western Schism. Yeah, so now, could I'm, you maybe I'm comment gonna, you know, on that? Now, it might be unsafe to assume that everybody watching this knows what the Great Western Schism was, right? I mean, uh, from 13... Of, of, sorry? I said some some of them will, but go ahead and give us an explanation. Well, you know, we... I mean, from 1378 to 1414, uh, there was no agreement in the Roman uh, part of the Catholic Church about who was pope. Um, there, there were at least, at any given time during that period, there were at least two and sometimes three claimants to the papal throne. And, and even saints disagreed about uh, which claimant uh, was correct, right? I, I, for instance, I mean, St. Catherine of Siena and St. Vincent Ferrer disagreed with each other, right? So it was really a very serious matter. Uh, now, what happened was in, I think it was 1415, the ongoing council of, of, of Constance slash Basil elected as Pope uh, a guy who took the name of Martin V. And Martin, you know, uh, claimed authority because he, he had been the only uh, claimant elected by a general council, as opposed to a compromised and divided College of Cardinals, right? So he said, look, I'm the legitimate pope, and so I'm going to rule, blah, 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 blah. And that, that effectively ended the schism. But one thing he also did, I mean, the, the council claimed for itself superiority to popes. The council figured, well, if we have the right to decide who's pope, then we have the right to rule on papal ruling. <laughs> uh, you know, th this is the doctrine of conciliarism, that general councils are superior to the pope and popes are answerable to them, right? Well, almost as soon as he was elected, you know, the first order of business after he got rid of his rivals, uh, Martin denied conciliarism. He said, no, wait a minute. Uh, General councils are not superior to popes. Popes are superior to general councils, right? Popes are answerable to nobody. Uh, we can admit that it's up to a particular body of bishops to decide who's going to be pope. I mean, we have to. What's the alternative, right? But that doesn't mean that an ongoing council of bishops is, a, 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 is an authority in the church superior to the pope, right? And in fact, to hold otherwise is heretical. And you know, and that that rejection of 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 um, 
conciliarism has stood to this day. So that that's that's how the warring, that's how the warring of the episcopate and of saints, by the way, as well, by the way, got resolved in the, uh, along with the great Western schism. But didn't Pope Martin require others uh, who are heretics to believe a profession of faith that seemed to have included Hague Sancta? It seems to teach uh, conciliarism. Um, could you maybe elaborate? Well, I, I would distinguish, you know, the way I would interpret I would distinguish between the authority of the council uh, to decide who's going to be pope, which is, which mm -hmm. is undisputed, mm -hmm. uh, and the authority of a council to decide when a pope's um, uh, doctrinal or disciplinary rulings are valid, right? Uh, as far as I interpret what happened, um, uh, the church affirmed the former but denied the latter. But it seems like a, a few popes actually still affirmed Hague Sancta. Now, I could yeah. be mistaken, but it seems that that was the case. And Hague no, but perhaps teaches, I'm misreading Hague Sancta. I mean, it's a long time since I, I looked at it. My, my personal opinion on it is that Hague Sancta is not speaking of just traditional conciliarism as we tend to think about it, mm -hmm. but is just asserting in cases of crisis. Okay. Which I, I don't have a problem with. In cases yeah, in, of in crisis. Cases of crisis yes, when there's no, yeah, in cases exactly. of crisis yes, when there's no agreement will. on who is Pope, how else are you going to decide? Exactly. A council is. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, so you know, not, I, I, don't, I never had I, a problem with, with that. Like if the College of Cardinals either. today, if the College of Cardinals today became yeah. corrupted and divided, so that different factions mm -hmm. of it were electing different men as Pope. Well, the, I think the only way to resolve something like that would be with a new council where the bishops just collectively get together and decide how to resolve it, which is exactly what happened at the Council of Constance. Which is why I don't have a problem with Hank Sancta, because I think it's talking about extreme situations. It's not talking about ordinarily bishops are over a pope. No, this is talking about a state of emergency when it's not clear uh, what, what's going on with the pope. Is he the pope? At that point, yes, the council, um, you know, Imperfect council, medical council, group of cardinals, bishops, whatever. Yes, they, they can sit in judgment on those matters. And I think that's all it was teaching. So when you have the popes affirming Hague Sancta, I don't think that's a blow to the Catholic position. That's and my I take think, on it. I know others disagree. I think, uh, and, and Hague Sancta also, um, <clears throat> it also stipulates that, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, that the council can't ever be dissolved and ratified until a pope actually signs on it. So they, yeah. they, they, so in other words, they claim to have authority to uh, sit in judgment, but then they also admit that decrees don't have any binding character until um, a pope signs on it, which is sticky. That's a sticky situation there. Um, yeah, I mean, if the council is the is the body that decides who's going to be pope, then you know, you know, well, what ha what actually the the stickiness is act what actually happened with Pope Martin. The, the council decided that he would be pope, uh, and then he proceeded to reject uh, the preve the prevailing understanding of conciliaris. <laughs> but you know, uh, I, to me, that makes perfect sense. I don't see any other questions. So, um, Eric, unless you have any anything else, we'll there, go ahead and wrap was, it up here. There was a there was an audience member. I think yeah. Lord have mercy is is the name. He, he I think he had a question that was divided into. Uh, uh, oh, okay. I got. You. I thought that was a comment. Okay, so if traditionalists appeal to tradition to justify uh, withholding assent to teaching and guidance that goes against tradition issuing from this Pope and magisterium, uh, then aren't they bearing witness to the uh, perspicuity of dogma and the sufficiency of patristic consensus as a standard for orthodoxy? Sorry, there's a mouthful there. <laughs> I can uh, put them back on the screen if you need me to. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, you know, th this, is this, this is fundamentalism of the same degree uh, as Protestant fundamentalism. The only difference is that instead of scripture alone, you've got uh, scripture of the fathers and the magisterium as your fundament, right? But ultimately, uh, the, the attitude in question eventuates in the same thing, namely, 
that the individual believer appealing to the perspicuity of the sources can understand and affirm that a positive faith uh, with sufficient clarity and, and certainty uh, uh, to override the authority of popes and councils. Right? Uh, so th this is, uh, I reject this as a Catholic, right? Uh, you, you, even if the individual believer happens to be right uh, in a particular instance, say, for example, whether a pope is heretical on such and such a point, uh, they have no authority to bind the church to their opinion, right? Ultimately, the individual uh, believer has to submit to the legitimate authority of the church or else that authority is meaningless. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up there because I, I don't see any other uh, follow up questions. So um, I really want to thank you for coming on the show and, and going over this with us. I, I would love to uh, have you on again to discuss uh, just more more topics, uh, basically anything that you're interested in. Uh, give me a suggestion. And we'll have you on again. Can you go ahead and maybe put in a plug for anything you're working on, any articles that you're writing or any? Uh, well, at the, moment, at, at, at the moment, at the moment. I mean, uh, for the last six months, I've had uh, last year, I started writing a book on the question, not the answer, mind you, but the question why the world exists. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can talk about answers some other time, but um, I oh, had yeah. some serious health problems in the latter half of last year um, that I've been proactively addressing this year. So I, I, I haven't written anything for a year on the book. But um, I resumed writing. I'm now three chapters in. And, uh, you know, I've gotten a few nibbles of interest from publishers. So, uh, and I'm applying for a fellowship to finish, so I can finish the book uh, without having to work at a job unrelated to it. Uh, so um, I'm writing a, a book on the question, why the world exists, which, is, which mainly focuses on how we must construe the question in order to come up with a useful answer. A useful and relevant answer. Um, it, it's not easy. I, you know, I, I look at. Well, anyway, I could go on and on about it, but that's. I'm just saying that's what I'm currently working on. Well, look, hey, I, I look forward to it, and um, you know, I'd like to have you on the show. We could discuss that further, or hey, any other topics that you're interested in. But I really want to thank you for your time and coming on. This was truly a pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Eric. And uh, I, I hope at some point uh, it does become feasible to get back on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll God bless you and Godspeed. <laughs> thank you. You too. And everyone, thank you for watching. Please comment, like, subscribe, share this on your social media, all that good stuff.